Welcome to this lecture on Gendering the Sacred and the Sensuous, Part 2. In this lecture, we would be discussing the concept of eroticism in the sculptural tradition of medieval Indian art. Coming to the issue of silp sastras, how the silp sastras kind of uh, discussed the kind of construction activity or the architectural styles had to be maintained. The, the biological fertility was made a symbol of societal growth. So, several silp sastras which were the treatises on art of the medieval period, they kind of codified and prescribed specific ideas about the fertility of women and how should the same be depicted on the monuments. So, there was one Silp Prakash which was a 10th century art text uh, from Orissa which is one such example. According to several Silp Shastras, the Mithuna couples played a very important role in the decoration of the religious spaces. Uh, in an essay called The Erotic Sculptures of India by Y. Krishan, uh, there is a description of several medieval texts namely Varaha Mihar's Brihat Samhita that, that can be dated to 6th century AD and uh, then there was Agni Puran dated 10th century AD and then Silp Prakash. All these recommended that the doors of the temples should be decorated by Mithuna couples as a symbol of auspiciousness. So, it is in this background that one can also describe the existence of Khajuraho temples which are full of sculptures of amorous couples. Uh, now, Tantricism and especially Kaula Kapalikas also carried on with this trend. The medieval period in India saw emergence of several Tantric cults in both Hinduism as well as Buddhism and Kaul Kapilika's cults was, a, was very powerful uh, in several regions uh, between 10th as well as 11th century AD and these calls they used to worship the Devi or the Shakti in solitude and they also indulged in five ritual practices. These five ritual practices uh, or makaras were mums that was flesh, then matsya, fish, madhira, wine, maithuna, sexual intercourse and mudra or mystical poses. Now, one cannot deny uh, tantric influence in iconography uh, or in the sculptural depiction of several couples. Even if several non-tantric methunas are also found on the temple walls of Khajuraho. Now, when one comes to the analysis of several erotic symbols, then several sects both related to uh, uh, Hinduism as well as Buddhism, Jainism, they have presented erotic motifs in their art. So, erotic representation was not only a regional phenomenon uh, rather than it was a pan Indian cultural phenomenon and this common uh, theme was seen in several beliefs and practices which show the uh, some kind of a connection between uh, uh, sex as well as religion. So, a valid question that arises here is that why so many temples were built in this period and why erotic motifs were depicted on them so blatantly, prominently and profusely. Uh, so, uh, coming to our discussion on Kapilakas, they used to be the worshippers of Rudra Bhairav and were described in several texts like Sankar Vijaya of Anandagiri as those with bodies that were smeared with ashes from a funeral pyre and they also wore strings or strings of skulls around their neck with their hair woven into a matted braid and they carried the skull in the right and a bell in the left hand. So, with this kind of a description uh, 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 as early as uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, probably even before uh, the coming of Britishers, some kind of a debate had started as to what was the significance of this kind of icono uh, I icon uh, iconography uh, and what was the logic behind. Uh, now, this can there can be no single explanation to this kind of a depiction and here comes uh, the relevance of explaining the debate that exists and varied, exp uh, varied explanations uh, that are part of this debate. So, uh, coming from the colonial standpoint and coming from uh, several European uh, observers, uh, they pointed out that there was some kind of a degeneration of morality that had probably uh, crept in the Indian society. So, for the colonial British rulers, Indian arts obsession, uh, obsession with the sensuality uh, and with the sensual body always provided a block to the appreciation of the beauty of Indian art. Indian sculpture was largely deemed as immoral and any kind of contact with it was believed to kind of impact the moral sensibility of humans. Uh, and in fact, as early as the 17th century, several European travelers had started criticizing uh, Indian sculptural tradition and they kind of uh, had great disdain because they considered this kind of depiction as immodest, uh, heathen style uh, and also uh, full of figures of monsters and in fact they thought that uh, these kind of monuments had nothing but uh, horror to depict. Uh, now the next kind of uh, description that one can give is that of the influence of tantricism. There were several scholars who have discussed that how the Methuna sculptures are nothing but the Kaul Kapilaka hermits uh, engaging in several tantric rituals because this was something which was very uh, uh, important part of their philosophy. So, several scholars like Devangana Desai and Y. Krishna opine that neither were these temples uh, for tantric deities nor were the sculptures a depiction of tantric hermits engaging in any kind of activity. So, they have a different kind of opinion altogether and Devangana Desai and Y. Krishna do not accept the view of those scholars who have kind tried to explain these uh, sculptures uh, through tantric tradition. So, according to this kind of uh, description, there is, is a need to look at the Devadasi tradition that was also rampant during this period of history. So, there comes the issue of Tantric versus Devadasi tradition. So, probably Khajuraho women, if they were not part of the Tantric ritual as is suggested by several scholars were probably Devadasis and that may be the sculptures reflect the daily activities in the lives of these women. So, in the medieval period, one needs to take into account that temples themselves had grown as a feudal institution and uh, uh, th there was some kind of a hierarchical system that had developed among the Devadasis, the musicians, the garland makers, etc. within the temple complex itself. So, the rising patronage that was coming for the temples from both the feudal as well as the mercantile class further promoted the Devdasi system and hence this kind of a depiction. However, those scholars who believe that there was some kind of a tantric influence, they have argued that the depiction of the several statue, several sculptures in a form of union of Purusha and Prakriti kind of brought about moksha or eternal bliss. So, in Tantra, this kind of copulation of the divine couple was the supreme form of worship and there was nothing obscene about it. Now, the third kind of interpretation that one can talk about is that of the royal prerogative. The importance of female sexuality 
as a marker of the fertility of the kingdom uh, is being reinforced by these uh, interpretations. So, the kings and the princes did commission the Khajuraho temples for their own glorification and uh, there was a kind of a politico uh, religious uh, you know legality also that was involved. Now, the next interpretation that one can talk about uh, while dissecting the iconography or dissecting the monuments of this period is that of magico defensive. There were several sculptures in which the princely male figure figures were depicted with women who could be Devadasis. So, they were probably considered to be magico defensive in function and were therefore uh, 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 and so therefore they could not be eliminated from the sculptural scheme of the temple as had been ordained by uh, several silpa sastras that I had just discussed. Then another logic could be female association with fertility and abundance which was going to make a particular state or a kingdom uh, far more stronger. Uh, so, women were associated not only with temptation, but also with fertility, abundance, prosperity and sexuality was definitely one route towards the divine, towards the uh, ultimate truth. And as there was also a reference to one of the Upanishads that in the embrace of his beloved, a man forgets the whole world, everything both within and without. So, with this kind of a philosophical understanding of this union, this kind of depiction was considered as but natural. Then the, uh, the very concept of body as the vehicle of divinity. This also was largely responsible for the arts of India both visual as well as literary to celebrate the beauty of the human body. The body as the harbinger of divinity bridged the gap between the sensuous and the sacred. So, the sensuous came to be largely projected as an integral part of the sacred. There was kind of no division between the two realms and this is something that had changed in the modern world. So, in the past the gods were always depicted as superhumanly beautiful, sensuous and it was largely believed that if the image was not beautiful, if the image was not perfect, then the deities could not be persuaded to inhabit the statue. So, the deities would inhabit a statue only if it was made of perfect proportion and it would be made in a perfect posture and form. Then another uh, logic that was given which is also mentioned in some of the Silpa Sastras is to ward off the evil eye. So, the erotic sculptures were intended to ward off the evil eye to prevent the buildings being struck by lightning or any other kind of destruction and uh, you know uh, Utkala Bhada uh, also kind of mentioned that no lightning will strike the building where this kind of a union was imaged. So, this could also be one of the explanations that was given. Now, next we come to the regional distribution of erotic, uh, these erotic sculptures. This will give you an idea of how uh, this was not a localized phenomenon, rather it was fairly widespread. So, while at Khajuraho in Madhya Pradesh, you can uh, trace a number of uh, such temples from 900 to uh, almost uh, 1050 CE. Then the other important regions were Bhubaneswar, Konark, Puri in Orissa, then uh, Limboji Mata temple at Delmel, then Mehsana uh, dated 10th century, the Nilkantha temple at Sunak near Baroda uh, were some of the important regions. Then there were uh, temples at Modhera in Gujarat. Uh, dated 1200 uh, and uh, then uh, Bhandevra temple near Ramgarh in Kota in addition to a number of uh, Ranakpur uh, uh, temples found near Udegir, Udepuri in Rajasthan dated 14th and 15th centuries. 
So, uh, the uh, these kind of temples that were found in east, west, north as well as south India. For example, in south India one can talk about Veerabhadra Swami temples of Kurnool and Guntur district dated 12th century in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, then uh, the Kesaya temple, then uh, some other temples uh, like, uh, like the Kedar Sivara temple Halibut 13th century in Karnataka. Most of these temples in India bore erotic sculptures uh, and they were to be found prominently in central India, mostly in Madhya Pradesh, in western India, in Gujarat, in eastern India, in Orissa and in the north uh, and in south India, uh, mostly in Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu dating uh, from 9th to 13th or 14th centuries CE. Now, uh, with this kind of temple activity going on, when was there a break in this kind of an activity, a break with the past? Now, this obsession with the beauty of the human body survived several waves of invasions. It was not as if uh, uh, with the beginning of the Islamic period that there was a dramatic break from India's sensual traditions. Instead, that break happened during the colonial period with the arrival of Christian missionaries, especially in the 19th century, because now it became an issue of morality. Now it became an issue of Victorian morality and how there was a complete reversal, there was a complete a banning of any such kind of activities. Now, uh, uh, one can also associate this morality to reformism in reaction to the British allegations about immorality, a new generation of British educated Indian reformers began critically re-examining their own traditions and hence a movement started that urged women to cover themselves up and purity and modesty were elevated as the ideal attributes of Indian womanhood. So, the kind of freedom and the kind of uh, you know uh, uh, cultural traditions that had existed in the past uh, were now increasingly questioned and now there was more and more emphasis on keeping the body covered. Uh, now, going back to what we were discussing, uh, coming to uh, the South Indian uh, uh, temple architecture, uh, we can talk about the Vijayanagar Empire and, and how the Portuguese traveller Domingo Pais, who had visited uh, during, who had uh, resided in the court from 1520 to 22 CE, has mentioned several temples of Krishnapura near Vijayanagar as having many figures of men and women and all in uh, showing very strange attitudes you know such kind of uh, uh, proximity had not uh, did not look normal to Domingo Pais uh, and uh, in fact one can find rarely a temple during the Vijayanagar Nayaka period in Tamil Nadu that is without such erotic images. Uh, the sculptural depiction of women is South Indian empires also followed the same trend that we had discussed for other regions and a detailed survey of different temples of Karnataka reveals uh, uh, also some different sides of women like the educated women uh, and highly accomplished women are represented in these sculptures of different periods. The Basava Puran of Bhima has mentioned several instruments that were played by women like kahale, flute, tala, etc. And as you can see uh, on your screens in this uh, sculpture of Hoysala uh, period, uh, the woman is clearly uh, shown holding a musical instrument. Uh, in a sculpture, uh, in this kind of sculptural tradition, there was not only an emphasis on the physical form or the physical beauty, but also on some kind of artistic accomplishment. Then in another sculpture of the same period, an elderly village lady doctor is shown examining the pulse of a young patient. Then another Hoysala sculpture of Belur shows a writing lady 
uh, uh, thereby showing that there was literacy for women also and several such kind of sculptures were unearthed from Jal Sangavi in Bidar district also. Uh, the several sculptures uh, of Vijayanagar period also show a lady student who is engrossed in learning a string instrument from her teacher and in a Chalukyan sculpture of Gadag, uh, another lady student is shown practicing archery which is quite well represented. Then uh, in another figure, a young lady is busy in exhibiting her gymnastic skills. The political interaction that the imperial cholas had with the Kalinga also seemed to initiate a new course of artistic uh, efflorescence in the region and since the middle of Chola period, the erotic arts also got into the mainstream of art in Tamil Nadu. Now comes also the issue of moulding of the erotic. As we see in most of the sculptural traditions of the Vijayanagar period, the sexual outburst of the preceding centuries gradually gave way to a more uh, kind of uh, different kind of uh, portrayal of women. And the period of about 200 years between the Hoishala and the Chalukyas to the Vijayanagar sculptures largely represents a change in the approach to depiction of women on temples. Uh, and the present remains of Vijayanagar period also show that there had been a great diminution in the sexual representation on temples in the course of these 200 years. The erotic motifs were depicted only in the unfrequented parts of the temple, for example, on the pillars or on the tall gopurams, which were largely hidden from uh, the public eye. They were also placed in a manner so as to remain hidden from the general audience. The treatment of the erotic motifs was in accordance, however, with the regional schools of art and artistic conventions. Each region had a distinctive approach towards sexual motifs which was also reflected in the place and the size assigned to them in the en entire architectural scheme of temple as well as in the choice of their thematic content. Now as I had told you that during the Vijayanagar period there was a change, there was a shift from an outright sexual portrayal to a more kind uh, to to a more diversified kind of uh, portrayal of women as you can see on the screen the vijayanagar carvings on the mahanavmi dibba portraying women engaged in hunting archery and there was now uh, more an emphasis on different activities that were performed by women rather than only on extolling their physical beauty and rounded curves. So we have wrestling ladies who are carved on a pillar of a hampi temple and in Pattadakal a woman dancer was shown practicing to the tune of accompanied music. Similar sculptures could be observed in almost all the temples of Karnataka. Then in this image again, you can see the female wrestlers. So uh, this again was a very different kind of a portrayal of women where they are shown as indulging in activities that uh, probably had been associated uh, earlier with the males. So instead of showing male wrestlers, uh, this uh, females in the uh, in Hampi performing wrestling forms a very interesting and, and, uh, and a curious piece of sculptural work. Then again uh, on this slide you can see women of Hampi riding an elephant and they were probably engaged in hunting or they were kind of uh, engaged in some activity related to uh, keeping a watchful eye. Then uh, in this uh, uh, slide also you can see women in Hampi performing several activities and not falling in the monotonous trap of voluptuous figures depiction which was the norm uh, in the past. So as has been uh, mentioned by Domingo Pais also who had visited, visited Vijayanagar in the 16th century. Uh, there is an evidence of these sculptures 
and he has stated that there were women who could wrestle, they could blow trumpets and horns and they could also handle sword. So, with these kind of unconventional roles, uh, 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 some kind of variation in the depiction appears and women were taught to dance inside the palace. There was a huge hall with pillars which had panels that showed various dance positions and in case a woman forgot the dance position, then she could very well look at that particular panel and just repeat the uh, whatever uh, step she had forgotten. Now, having discussed these various uh, sculptural traditions as well as given you an insight uh, regarding various causations that could have caused this kind of iconography to emerge, uh, I hope some more interesting insight would be developed if all of you go back to the reading material that I have referred to and then you can come up with your own explanation. Thank you.